Today I'm going to do solo runs with Skarmory and Mantine to determine which one is better for soloing a Generation 2 game. The first question on many of your minds might be, why pair these two Pokemon together? Because honestly that's what I would be thinking in your position. Here's the thing, Skarmory and Mantine are actually a duo. They sit next to each other in the Pokedex, and when you take a look at their base stats, it becomes clear that these two are two different sides of the same coin. Mantine is good on the special side of things, whereas Skarmory is good on the physical side of things. Both of them are walls with 140 in their respective defensive stat, and 80 in their offensive stat. They share 65 HP and 70 speed, and their non-primary attacking stat is quite bad, 40. So I'm really not going to be wanting to use any special moves with Skarmory or physical moves with Mantine. Now Pokemon Crystal takes a little while to get interesting because I have to complete the Mr. Pokemon quest, so while I do that, let's compare their move pools. Mantine starts with Tackle and Bubble, it learns Supersonic at level 10, which hopefully isn't going to be very useful because it has trash accuracy. After that it gets Bubble Beam, Takedown, Agility, Wing Attack, and then finally Confuse Ray. Through TMs and HMs it gets access to Headbutt, Curse, Hidden Power, Blizzard, Icy Wind, Rain Dance, Mud Slap, Surf, Whirlpool, Waterfall, and Ice Beam through the Move Tutor. By the way, that guy only exists in Pokemon Crystal, so if you're playing Gold and Silver, Mantine won't have access to Ice Beam. Skarmory starts with Leer and Peck. It gets Sand Attack, Swift, Agility, Fury Attack, and Steel Wing through Level Up. And then through TMs and HMs, it gets access to Curse, Hidden Power, Sunny Day, Mud Slap, Sandstorm, Steel Wing, and Fly. I should mention that both of these Pokemon do have access to Return, and for Skarmory I can see that move being very useful, but for Mantine it's probably not going to have much of a role. On my way walking back to Cherry Grove City I was really wishing that these games had the running shoes, It'd just be nice to move a bit faster, especially when I'm doing a speed run. But while these games don't have awesome shoes, you can because you can get a pair of Vessies. They're fantastic everyday sneakers that are 100% waterproof. They're made out of a special material called Dymatex that is a dual climate knit material that keeps you cool in the summer and warm in colder weather, like in Canada where I live. Now after shoveling snow or walking through slush, my socks stay dry. Even if Dratini uses waterfall on my shoes, my socks are safe, which is important because they have Charmander on them. Now I usually hate the feeling of new shoes. They're stiff and they take days to become as comfortable as my old worn out pair. However, Vessi really stunned me here because my pair was immediately comfortable. Adding to this comfort is the fact that they're lightweight and breathable. Now I don't like to talk about products that I don't personally use, and so I have a confession here. I didn't actually have a pair of Vessies before this sponsorship, but my fiance did, and she constantly talked about how much she loved them, so much so that I specifically tracked Vessie down and asked them to do a sponsorship with me. <laughs> Vessies are now my go-to shoes by my door. They're giving away a pair of socks of your choice to the first 100 shoes sold using my code SOCKSSCOTTSTHOUGHTS. Also, check out their early Black Friday sale at Vessie.com slash SCOTTSTHOUGHTS. If you missed the chance to get a free pair of socks, Vessie's early Black Friday sale is on now, Get the style and size you want before they sell out. And now let's get back to Mantine vs. Skarmory. I chose to replace Totodile at the start of the game with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer so that the rival would pick Chikorita. After all, this is definitely going to be the hardest rival's team for Mantine to face. Yes, I know that grass moves are only going to deal neutral damage to it because the flying type resists grass, but Cyndaquil would be obviously easier, and Totodile has terrible moves, like the best moves it get are like Water Gun, so in this case the rival having Razor Leaf in Azalea Town is going to give Mantine the hardest time. So let's discuss one of the major drawbacks that Mantine has in the early game. The only special move it has access to is Bubble, and Bubble has base 20 power, so after the same type attack bonus, its effective power is 30, as you can see in the top left. Tackle's base power is higher than Bubble's effective power, which is not very good, but because Mantine's stats are so asymmetric, it's going to make more sense to use Bubble in this section of the game, and that's really going to slow it down. Most of the wild Pokemon that I'm fighting, I'm knocking out in 3 hits. Now you might ask, Scott, why are you facing wild Pokemon? Doesn't it just make more sense to run away from everything and save some time? Well, my experience tells me that the answer is no in this situation, because both Skarmory and Mantine are slow growth rate Pokemon. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you're probably just like, oh no, this is going to be bad. But if you're new to these Pokemon challenges, yeah, slow growth rate Pokemon do not perform particularly well in most cases. They require a lot of additional training just to keep pace with the level curve of the game, and that's even the case in Johto. So to compensate for this in the early game, I'm going to fight all the wild Pokemon that I encounter, as well as fighting all of the trainers on the route before Violet City. After all, trainers do give 1.5 times the experience that wild Pokemon give, so whenever I can fight a trainer over a wild Pokemon, I'm going to want to do that. 
grinding in the wild is like the worst possible thing, especially in Johto games where every wild Pokemon is like under level 10. I know that's an exaggeration, but it really feels like that sometimes. Before Violet City, I pick up the Bitterberry. After all, this is going to be very useful later in the game. Then I defeat one last trainer and spend some time in this grass patch. What I'm looking for is a Bellsprout because it can be used for Flash and Cut. I know Flash isn't strictly mandatory, but I play these games at four times game speed on an emulator, so I really should get it because navigating dark places is very hard when the game goes this fast. I catch it, see Bellsprout's nice Pokedex number, and then I head into Violet City. Now normally in my playthroughs this is where I'd face Sprout Tower, but with Mantine I'm a little bit worried about that. Defeating the Bellsprout there when they only know moves like Vine Whip and Growth does not seem like a good idea when I'm going to have to be using Tackle. So let's head to Faulkner's Gym first. Against the first Bird Keeper in his gym, I'm noticing a trend with Mantine. It gets taken to low health very quickly in almost every battle because the majority of the moves in the early game are all physical moves. That means right now that its highest stat, its special defense, is being underutilized. I pop out of the gym, go to the Mart, and pick up some potions just so I can heal it after every battle. I defeat the final Bird Keeper in the gym, and now it's time to face Faulkner. He leads with a level 7 Pidgey, and my Mantine is now level 10, so that's over a damage rounding threshold. I go for Bubble, it does about a third, and here I'm lucky because the Pidgey has to use Tackle. After all, Mantine's a flying type, and Mudslap can't hit it, so I'm not really worried as long as Faulkner can't do enough damage to me. By the time I knock the Pidgey out, I've only taken 6 hit points of damage, so I'm feeling pretty confident against the Pidgeotto. Luckily Mantine's fairly fast, so it moves first, it does what looks like a 6th to the Pidgeotto, and then it strikes back with Gust, which is actually doing a decent amount to me. However, I've given Mantine a berry, so it heals its own health, and I think because of this I'm going to be able to take the victory. We go back and forth with Bubble and Gust, and the Pidgeotto does manage to take me down to 9 hit points, which is just above red health before I knock it out. With that, Faulkner's defeated, and Mantine clocks in with a time of 8 minutes and 30 seconds in its first gym split. So now let's switch over and see how Skarmory deals with the early stages of the game. Well, one thing that's immediately apparent is there's some asymmetry here. Skarmory starts with Peck, which is a physical attack, and it gets the same type attack bonus. So it has an effective power of 52.5. By the way, my overlay rounds up because having the decimal point up there just like looks so terrible. Another big advantage here is that a lot of the early game Pokemon are like Caterpie and Hophip, which are bug and grass types respectively. And yeah, Peck is super effective against them. So the training that I'm doing here is just going faster. When I make it back to Cherry Grove City, I face the rival and obviously I've chosen for him to have Cyndaquil. This will definitely be the hardest because Skarmory is a steel type. On Route 30, as I head towards Violet City, I take the same approach that I did with Mantine. I fight every trainer, and I fight all the wild encounters that I run into. And while Mantine was usually 3-hitting most Pokemon, Skarmory at worst is getting a 2-hit. I finish this route off by catching myself a Bellsprout, and then I head towards Sprout Tower. After all, Skarmory has Peck, which is super effective, so I can do some extra training here early on in the game. Honestly, Skarmory is very terrifying. I've learned this in Generation 3 when facing Steven. Like, oh, it's so awful to fight against, and I think that all the sages in Sprout Tower feel that way right now. I make quick work of all of them and then head to Faulkner's Gym, and here we can see that having a high defense stat is more advantageous than having a high special defense stat in the early game. Additionally, the Steel type means I resist almost every type in the game, like I resist 70% of the types in the game, it is insane. So all of the normal and flying type attacks here, Skarmory just shrugs off. That prevents the Mart trip that I had to take with Mantine before I make it to Faulkner. Okay, let's do this. Now if this was Generation 1, I'm sure his AI would see the fact that I'm a Steel type and just go like, Ah, Mudslap, great! But in this case, it knows that it can't use that move, so his Pidgey is stuck using Tackle, which does one damage to Skarmory. Yeah. So I've won this fight, I don't even think we need to talk about it anymore. I will just mention here that I named Skarmory Fan, and that's because I did check the Wikipedia page and look through the trivia and see like, what's Skarmory based on? It says it has a lot in common with the Andean Condor and Cranes, birds that are actually held in high esteem in Japan. In addition, it says that its design resembles a wyvern. There's a bunch of other information, I really suggest all of you check it out, but uh, all of these things I could not fit into three characters. So I ended up going with the last thing here, which says its wings also resemble a Japanese paper hand fan. And uh, yeah, I needed a three character name because Mantine is named Ray. So to keep things fair, that's why I went with this name. 
It clocks in, defeating Faulkner with a time of 8 minutes and 1 second. That's 29 seconds faster than Mantine. So now, with Faulkner out of the way, I want to discuss a fact that's not very well known about the Generation 2 games. So when you obtain some of the badges, they give your stats a boost. As you can see in the bottom left, I have a little badge icon faintly behind the attack stat, and that's to reference the fact that this attack stat is boosted by 12.5% after I've obtained Faulkner's badge. Whitney's badge boosts your speed, Jasmine's badge boosts your defense, and Price's badge boosts your special attack, and it really should boost your special defense, but it doesn't always. Like, yeah, it's kind of annoying, there's a glitch around that, I'll talk about it later when it becomes relevant. Now I bet you already knew those facts, especially if you're a viewer of this channel, but you might not know the fact that these badges also give your moves a type-based boost. So Faulkner's badge boosts all your flying type moves by 12.5%. So uh, yeah, once again, Peck is very good. Let's really think about it. Skarmory gets the same type attack bonus on this move. It utilizes its higher offensive stat. It also gets the 12.5% boost to its attack stat, which Peck utilizes because it's a physical move. And then finally, it gets a 12.5% boost because of the type of the move, bringing it up from an effective power of 53 to an effective power of 59. So in the early stages of the game, it's quite clear that Skarmory is just going to outperform. However, in Generation 1, special attackers are definitely better than physical attackers. And I do think that overall, Mantine's move pool is more expansive and has better coverage, so I think that Skarmory might fall off as it gets towards the late game. But we're going to have to wait to find out. By the way, I asked all of you in a poll here on YouTube who you thought would perform better, and these are the results. I personally think that Skarmory is going to perform better just because it is such a beast in Generation 3, and also, like, Mantine is the most forgettable Pokemon ever. Like, genuinely, I kind of forget that this thing even exists in Generation 2. I did a whole series on my channel playing through the Generation 2 games with forgotten Pokemon, so this sort of feels like the natural conclusion to that series. However, Skarmory is definitely not forgotten. With it, I make it to Azalea Town. Now, you'll notice at this point that I didn't pick up the TM for Swift in Union Cave. And the reason I didn't do that was I didn't want to bump into extra wild encounters and take a little bit of time out of my way to pick up a move that has a base power that's only one higher than Peck's effective power. After all, Skarmory's going to learn Swift through level up at level 19. So it didn't really feel worth investing 30 to 40 seconds picking this TM up when I'm just going to get it anyways. As I fight the Rockets, I'll just mention that on the previous routes I fought every trainer that made sense to fight. There's a guy with Poliwags that can use Hypnosis on you that I chose not to fight because that's just so annoying. Also, there's the guy with like a million magic harps, and they give like no experience, so yeah, I skipped him as well. I defeat the rocket with coughing, Kurt heals me, and then I head into Azalea's gym. Now, here's another advantage that Skarmory has. Peck is super effective against all of the bugs here, so I don't expect that Bugsy is going to be particularly challenging. He leads with Metapod. I go for Peck, and it doesn't get the one hit. Metapod just uses String Shot, lowering my speed, and then I take it out on the next turn. Next, Bugsy sends in Scyther, his ace, and uh, yeah, its Fury Cutter does one damage to Skarmory. I get a critical hit with Peck, taking it all the way down to orange health, and while Scyther strikes back with Quick Attack doing two damage, I knock it out on the next turn. So yeah, Bugsy, incredibly easy. After all, his only Pokemon left is Kakuna, and it has Poison Sting, but obviously, Skarmory can't be poisoned, it's a Steel type. Also, Peck just knocks it out in a single hit, so that's it. Next I have to face the rival. This is the first point in the game where Skarmory could be threatened. I use Peck against the Ghastly, and it doesn't knock it out, allowing it to use Lick, which paralyzes me. Ugh, that's so painful. Now, Ghastly can't really do much else to me, like it can do a little bit of chip damage here and there, so I knock it out, level up to 18 over a damage rounding threshold, and then I move on to his ace, Quilava. The issue now is that it's moving first, it uses Ember, which does more than a third to me, Skarmory's fully paralyzed, it hits another Ember, taking me to orange health, and then finally I hit with Peck, but it only does a third. Even with the little bit of healing that my berry provides, I don't have the sustain I need, and the Quilava takes me out. So that's the first reset of the entire video. Because of how much damage I was dealing, I would have been able to defeat the Quilava if I wasn't paralyzed, so I just need to try the fight again, because what's the likelihood that Ghastly paralyzes me again first turn with Lick? Well, in this case, it doesn't even matter, because I get a critical hit right away and knock it out in one hit. Alright, that's good. 
Kolava's next, and now that I'm not paralyzed, I'm pretty sure that I can take it out. And in this case, I'm correct. I knock it out and move on to the Zubat, which is like not going to do much. It does use Bite. By the way, in Generation 2, Steel types resist Dark type moves. This was changed in Generation 6, so now in modern Pokemon games, Steel types don't resist Dark type moves. After chasing a Farfetch'd around in the forest, I get cut, and it's worth noting that Skarmory can actually learn this move. If we're just looking at effective power, it actually appears that cut at this point would be better than peck, but after all the bonuses that I talked about earlier in the game, yeah, it's not going to be useful, and also it only has 95% accuracy, so I really want to avoid this move. And here I did make a mistake, I went and picked up the TM for Headbutt, but it turns out that Skarmory can't actually learn this move. When I think about it, I'm not really sure why, its head is steel, and it has kind of a horn on it. It seems like it would be very effective to use it as a weapon, but I don't know, at least uh, Mantine can learn it, I guess. Outside of the forest, I continue fighting trainers. After all, I'm going to keep fighting almost every single trainer in the game. I want to make sure that these slow growth rate Pokemon are set up for success in the late game. Here, Skarmory learns Swift, and then after I defeat the rest of the trainers, I proceed to Goldenrod City. If you're a new viewer to the channel, you might wonder what I do next, so here let me quickly summarize. I go to the underground, pick up the coin case, buy myself an Abra so I can use Teleport, pick up Kenya so that I can use it as my fly mule, and then on the route north of Goldenrod City, I continue my training by defeating all the trainers. Oh, and then I fight this guy who has two Magmars. By the way, I saved before this fight because I know that he can be really bad. Unfortunately, the first Magmar burns Skarmory, and uh, yeah, that cuts my attack stat, which is really unfortunate. Like, my attack is actually lower than my special attack now. Ugh. As a result, Skarmory goes down, and that's its second reset. Okay, uh, let's just sneak by this guy. I don't think it makes sense to fight him. After talking to Floria next to Pseudo Wudo, I use Avra to teleport back to Goldenrod City, and now I'm ready to face Whitney. She leads with Clefairy. I go for Peck, it does just under half, and then Clefairy tries to slap Skarmory, which honestly does not seem like it would be very good. Seems like that should deal recoil. I go for Peck again, this one gets a critical hit, knocking the Clefairy out. Okay, time for Mill Tank, and I am kind of scared here. While my Steel type does resist rollout, my Flying type is weak to it, so it's going to deal neutral damage. Still, Skarmory has incredible defense, so I should be okay. Just for extra safety, I start the fight off by using Mud Slap to lower Mill Tank's accuracy. After all, if I can break the rollout combo before it gets too powerful, that would be ideal. After that, I figured maybe I'll use Leer once just to lower its defense, and then I can use an attacking move after. And here, I want to note just how many times Stomp causes Skarmory to flinch. So I flinch once, then I get my Leer in, then I flinch again, Peck hits, it does a decent amount of damage, and then I flinch again, and again, like I cannot believe the luck that I'm getting here. Finally, I managed to knock the mill tank out, and with it I earn Whitney's badge which boosts my speed. And it also boosts the power of all of my normal type moves, now making Swift the most effective move that Skarmory has. So Skarmory just clocked in with an even 21 minutes at Whitney. Now how is Mantine going to do with the next two gym leaders, and will it perhaps be able to catch up with Skarmory? After all, there was a 29 second difference between them on the Faulkner split. And uh, I'm just going to say right now, it's probably not going to catch up. After all, it still has to use Bubble and Tackle throughout the majority of the next section of the game. If we examine its learn set, it's going to get Bubble Beam at level 18, and I think that is realistic before Bugsy. After all, Skarmory went into that fight at level 17, and they have the same growth rate, so that does mean I'm going to need to defeat every trainer as I go if I have any hope of getting this powerful water move. In this case though, when I'm in Union Cave, I think that it is worth it to go and pick up Swift. After all, Mantine isn't going to get a powerful physical move until level 20 in the form of takedown, and uh, yeah, it has 85% accuracy and it does recoil damage to the user, so I do not want to use that move today. When I was in Slowfolk's Well defeating the rockets, you can see that I'm using Swift the majority of the time here, and that's because at this point I think it's more powerful than Bubble. However, I'm not entirely sure with the discrepancy between Mantine's special attack and attack stat even after Faulkner's boost. Either way, I'm pretty sure it's not going to matter. Like in this case, I almost one hit the Rattata, but Bubble would have just two hit it anyways. So I don't think there's any time savings here if I was using Bubble and it actually did slightly more damage. In Bugsy's Gym, I fight all the trainers to get as much experience as possible. And after that, I don't have quite enough to get Bubble Beam. So I head back to the little patch of grass just outside Union Cave and train until I finally learn this powerful water type move. Now I'm ready for Bugsy. With the same type attack bonus, Bubble Beam now has an effective power of 98. Metapod, of course, has lower special defense than it has physical defense, so I use Bubble Beam and it gets the one-shot. Okay, that's good. 
Next, Bugsy sends in Kakuna, and Bubble Beam one-shots it as well. And then it's time for the Scyther. It goes for Quick Attack, which actually does quite a bit. Okay, that was a critical hit. It makes sense now. I use Bubble Beam. It does just under half. Scyther starts to set up Fury Cutter, but it doesn't do much. After all, Mantine resists this move because it's a flying type. I go for Bubble Beam again. It takes Scyther to red. And now I'm sure that I can win. I survive its quick attack and knock it out of the next turn. Okay, so as I walk over to face the rival, let's compare the splits between these two Pokemon on Bugsy. Now the unfortunate thing here is that training to get Bubble Beam put Mantine very far behind. It is now lagging 4 minutes and 25 seconds, which when this is time spent playing the game at 4 times speed, is a absolutely huge margin. However, it might be able to claw back a little bit of this time fighting the rival. After all, Skarmory did have a reset here. First is Ghastly, I go for Bubble Beam, and it one-shots. Okay, no paralysis. Next, he sends in Zubat, and I use Bubble Beam, which also one-shots. Finally, it's time for the Bayleaf. Since it resists my Bubble Beam, I use Swift. It does about a third with a critical hit. Bayleaf uses Poison Powder because it can see that it can't one-shot me with any of its moves. I continue using Swift, which is doing uninspiring damage. Bayleaf misses a Razor Leaf. That's very convenient. I hit with Swift again. Poison does a little bit. It hits with Razor Leaf, which does like almost nothing. Okay. Mantine is really good against all of the rival's teams. So I finish him off, and that victory was much easier than with Skarmory. In the forest, I pick up the Headbutt TM, and yeah, Mantine can learn it, but Skarmory can't. Like, Mantine has these cute little, like, I don't know what they are, like, antenna on its head. Those don't look particularly good for headbutting with. Is it the fact that Mantine has more of a, like, flat surface to headbutt with? Uh, I'm not sure. I teach it in the place of headbutt, and then I proceed on to the route before Goldenrod City. Now, throughout the whole Goldenrod section of the game, I take the same approach that I had with Skarmory, doing lots of extra training. And while there are electric Pokemon at this point in the game, like there's this guy who has some Magnemites and Voltorbs, and there's another guy by the Fire Breather who defeated Skarmory, who has, like, a level 2 Voltorb, but yeah, none of these Pokemon know electric moves, so Mantine's not going to take 4 times damage from any of them. As a result, I make it to Whitney without any resets. So while Skarmory's moving faster, Mantine is getting through the game more consistently. But how is it going to do against Whitney? After all, in this case, Rollout is super effective. She leads with Clefairy. I go for Bubble Beam. Clefairy has higher special defense, and it survives the attack. I think it probably would have survived a physical attack anyways. It hits me with Double Slap four times, which actually does decent damage, and then I knock it out. Okay, time for her ace, Miltank. I go for Bubble Beam, it does just under half, and then Miltank hits Rollout, which gets a critical hit, and it takes Mantine just above half health. I am so lucky that the next Rollout misses, like, so lucky. It uses Milk Drink, prolonging the fight a little bit, but then I realize that I'm actually speed tied with the Miltank, we both have 48 speed, so Mantine moves first on the final turn, and I knock it out. Okay, I can definitely see that fight going the other way if Rollout doesn't miss. I might need to be careful there in my follow-up playthrough. After all, in these challenges, I like to verify my results and try to improve the Pokémon's times. I don't think it's particularly fair to rank Pokemon when you only do one playthrough, so that's why I'm always going to do multiple attempts. Everyone has favorite Pokemon, and one of yours might be Mantine or Skarmory, and so I want to make sure that I do justice to every Pokemon, just in case it's someone's favorite. So comparing the results from Whitney's split, Mantine was able to get some of the time back. It now lags behind by 3 minutes and 27 seconds. It earned back about 15 seconds of time on the rival in Azalea Town, and then it earned 43 seconds of time during the Goldenrod split. I'd say that's because Bubble Beam is one-shotting Pokemon quicker. After all, now Mantine has a move that is more powerful than Skarmory's moves. And that's probably going to persist for the rest of the playthrough. After all, look at the moves it gets access to. Oh, look at Blizzard. It has two little hashtags down there. Oh, yeah, and the, uh, the header is uh, the Steel-type color. Uh, just wonderful. Believe me, I will fix that later. Not going to fix it in post, because fixing things in post, I, I can't even describe how long it takes to, like, update one number in the overlay, because we have to, like, cross-dissolve it a million times and, like, weave all these graphics around it. It's terrible. It takes, like, eight hours to fix one thing. I actually spent 12 hours one day fixing the splits in Machamp vs. Golem. So uh, go check out that video if you want to like see my handiwork just to make it look normal. Tip for all of you that want to film videos like this, never ever film in the splits. Never. <laughs> Always add them in post or uh, yeah, just show them on screen like I have been up until this point in the video. Okay, back to the playthrough. In my first playthrough with every Pokemon, I require myself to defeat Sudowoodo. And uh, yeah, Mantine just stomps this thing with Bubble Beam. 
Now at this point in the playthrough I need to mention my approach to hidden power in these playthroughs. I set my Pokemon near perfect DVs at the start of the game to ensure fair comparison at the end of the video. After all, I don't want to trash Skarmory going up against like a near perfect Mantine and then the results are all skewed because of that. Because of the fact that hidden powers type and power are determined by the Pokemon's DVs, I do have to deviate slightly from perfect Pokemon just so I can ensure variety in this move. Now I could just randomize hidden power, but that doesn't really seem fair because believe me, some hidden powers are uh, very bad. Like fighting, for instance, which completely tanks your attack and defense stat. It takes those DVs down to 12 each, whereas hidden power ice, you have 15 attack and 13 defense. So I allow myself to choose the type of hidden power, and it's always going to be a base 70 power move. By the way, my overlay is going to calculate both hidden powers type and power in the top left, so you can see it at any time if you're curious. For Mantine, I decided to go with Hidden Power Ground. After all, this thing has a 4 times weakness to electric attacks. Ground is going to allow me to effectively deal with those Pokemon, and I was really thinking about Pokemon like Jasmine's Magnemite. Also, the rival in Burn Tower who's coming up next has a Magnemite too. But before I face him, I want to clear out the Kimono Girls, and after I do that, I get the HM for Surf, which is going to be absolutely broken on Mantine. It has 143 effective power. Now with this move, I'm ready to face the rival. Because Hidden Power Ground is super effective against the Haunter, I went for it, but like, I really should have just gone for Surf there. Higher special attack would have ensured that I got the one hit. At least it just uses Lick, doesn't paralyze me, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Hidden Power Ground is the better choice against Magnemite, after all it does 4 times damage, and then I use Surf to take out his Zubat. Okay, time for the Bayleaf. Now in this case, the effective power for Headbutt is slightly higher after Whitney's badge boosted the power of my normal type moves, but Surf is going to be better here just because of my higher special stat. So it takes 4 turns, but I do knock the Bayleaf out without fainting. Still no resets for Mantine. This thing is very consistent. Like if you want to do a playthrough where you just don't black out before Morty, this is the Pokemon for you. Now I'm going to do what is becoming a typical ordering in my videos. I head out onto Route 38, clear out the trainers here, collecting the Mint Berry and Nugget as I go, and this also levels Mantine up as much as is possible before I teleport back to Ecritique City and take on Morty. He leads with Ghastly. Clearly I haven't learned my lesson because I go for Hidden Power Ground, and it knocks the Ghost out in a single hit. Okay, that's good. By the way, Mantine is just fast enough that it's going to outspeed all of his ghosts. I go for Hidden Power Ground on the next Haunter, and it also goes down in one hit. Okay, he's not going to put a curse on me today. Next is Gengar. And of course I prepared for this thing by making Mantine hold the Mint Berry. Now, if Gengar uses Hypnosis successfully, I won't stay asleep. Hidden Power does just over half. Gengar doesn't go for Hypnosis in a strange turn of events and uses Shadow Ball, which does like a quarter, and then I knock it out on the next turn. So yeah, Morty's final Haunter stands no chance against me, I knock it out, and with that I've earned myself the fourth badge. Mantine clocks in on the Morty split with a time of 32 minutes and 29 seconds. In Olivine City I grab the Good Rod, pick up some Super Repels, grab Strength, and then I catch myself a Krabby. After that I head into the Lighthouse fighting some of the trainers here, and I finish this area of the game off by fighting Dennis, who is, if you don't know, a regular viewer of the channel. After that I head towards the beach, and here I pick up the Sharp Beak. This is a great item because it'll boost my flying type attacks by 10%. Then as I'm surfing I decide to face some trainers. After all I'm going to backtrack here later to pick up a rare candy in the Whirl Islands, so if I can't run into these trainers I'll save a little bit of walk time then. Now it's time for Chuck's Gym, and first I have to contend with the tag team trainers. Today Mantine doesn't struggle against either of them. I defeat all the trainers in Chuck's Gym, head back to the Pokemon Center, heal up, and now it's time for the Fighting Master. Chuck leads with Primeape. I go for Surf, it doesn't get the KO, Primeape uses Leer, lowering Mantine's already low defense, and then I knock it out with a second Surf. Okay, that's uh, not great, but the Polyrath probably knows that Dynamic Punch is not very effective against me, so it won't use it. Right? I go for Surf, I think this is probably the best move against the Polyrath, it does very little, and then it tries Dynamic Punch. Okay, that's weird. I switch into Headbutt, after all I'm outspeeding, and this causes Polyrath to flinch. Okay, that's good. I go for Headbutt again, it takes Polyrath to half, and it causes a second flinch. This is really good. But then Polyrath hits a Dynamic Punch, gets a critical hit, and does so much to Mantine. This move always confuses, so this is not looking good. I hit myself, which is bad because my defense is lowered. Polyrath misses a Dynamic Punch, and then I hit another Headbutt. Okay, that's good. 
but unfortunately, Polyreth does get another dynamic punch in, which takes Mantine out. I can't believe that this thing got its first reset against Chuck of all people. Now, level 32 is just before a damage rounding threshold, so I decide to head out to sea and do a little bit more training just to level up one more time, because that will make this fight more consistent. When I come back, I know that I'm not going to one-hit the Primeape, so I go for Headbutt first turn just in case it flinches. It doesn't, I get my defense lowered, and then I knock it out with Surf on the next turn. Okay, time for the Polyrath. I get lucky here because I get a critical hit on the first turn, then it misses Hypnosis. I go for another Headbutt, which takes it to half. It misses another Hypnosis. My third Headbutt causes a flinch, and then Polyrath's third Hypnosis finally puts me to sleep. But uh, yeah, I recover with the Mint Berry and knock it out with Headbutt. So Mantine clocks in after Chuck with a time of 40 minutes and 29 seconds. So it's been a while since we saw Skarmory, let's head back and see how it does in this section of the game after it defeated Whitney. Now what we had started to become aware of was the fact that Skarmory is sort of falling behind because its moves aren't as powerful. Right now, Swift is its most powerful move, and yeah, this move isn't really going to help against Pseudo Wudo. Instead, I decide to go for Mud Slap, lowering its accuracy. After that, I tried Swift, even though Pseudo Wudo resists it, but yeah, this wasn't a good choice. I just used Mud Slap here. I managed to take it out easily and proceed to Ecritique City. Now, before I do anything else, I'm also going to go and pick up Hidden Power, and for Skarmory, I've also chosen Hidden Power Ground. After all, with lower special attack and special defense, I think that having a physical move that covers my electric weakness is a good idea. After all, one of the first electric types in the entire game is the Jolteon that the Kimono Girls have, so I wanted to have coverage against it. Plus, at this point in the game, Hidden Power with a base 70 power is actually Skarmory's most powerful move. It's actually the move that deals the most damage for Skarmory. The Rival and Burn Tower is next, and in this case, using Hidden Power Ground against the Haunter does enough damage to knock it out in one hit. Obviously it takes care of the Magnemite, and then Quilava's next. That's another reason that Hidden Power Ground is going to be very useful. It takes it out in two hits, I move on to the Zubat, knock it out with Swift, and that's it. I also grab the Mint Berry before I face Morty, but with Skarmory I'm really not worried against him. Hidden Power Ground one hits the first Ghastly, one hits the second Haunter, and maybe it's even going to want to hit the Gengar, after all this thing has very low defense. And unfortunately it doesn't quite get it, Gengar does put me to sleep, but the Mint Berry heals it and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, hopefully I won't need the Mint Berry for Chuck, I know I can get another one, but like I really don't want to. I knock the Haunter out and that's it for Morty. Skarmory clocks in with a time of 29 minutes and 54 seconds, so now it's only 2 minutes and 35 seconds ahead of Mantine. I think that the power of a move like Surf might be starting to show its effectiveness here. With Skarmory I prioritize picking up the Sharp Beak because this is going to boost the effective power of Peck up to 65. This is the move that just like perpetually gets boosts, first the Stab boost, then the Attack boost from Faulkner's badge, and the Flying boost from Faulkner's badge, and now it is additionally getting the Sharp Beak boost. But unfortunately for it, as hard as Peck tries, it is not as powerful as Hidden Power Ground. I defeat Dennis, saying hi again. You can say hi to him in the comments if you can find his comment, it'll probably just say Scott. And after that, I surf across the sea and head into Chuck's gym. I don't have any issues against any of the trainers here, so let's just get on to the battle with the gym leader. Chuck sends in Primate first, and obviously Peck is the best move here. While I'm using it, I just want to say that this move has really worn out its welcome. I need a better flying type attack. I find it strange that Mantine learns wing attack when it has like, I don't know, like... It looks like a jelly wings because it's like a manta ray thing. But like Skarmory, it has like razor blade fan wings and it cannot learn wing attack. How is that fair? But Skarmory can learn fly and that does make sense. I could see this thing flying around like a plane. Whereas Mantine, it's definitely going in the ocean. I cannot see it flying more than just like jumping out of the water. So with Skarmory, I defeat Chuck on my first attempt and I clock in with a time of 35 minutes and 19 seconds. Now Skarmory is 5 minutes and 10 seconds ahead of Mantine. So the gap has widened by a lot. Perhaps because Mantine had to reset on Chuck and do some extra training. I'm starting to wonder now if Skarmory is just going to completely outperform Mantine in these entire playthroughs. It really seems like things are going that way. Even with the deck stacked against it with its move pool, it's just able to squeeze out better results. However, Mantine does get a big advantage now, because by using Fly, I can head back to Cherry Grove City and pick up the Mystic Water, which is going to boost the effective power of Surf up to 157. After defeating the Red Gyarados, I also flew back to New Bark Town and picked up the Pink Bow. This is going to be good for boosting the power of normal type moves. 
uh, if I ever use them. I think at this point, it pretty much just makes sense to use Surf all the time, even on Pokemon that resist it. After all, the discrepancy between Mantine's special attack and regular attack is quite large. I steamrolled my way through the Rocket plotline. Now you might ask, why am I not facing Jasmine next? After all, she's sort of intended to be the 6th gym leader in any playthrough. Well, with Mantine, I'm pretty scared of her Magnemites. They have high defense, I have low attack, and I'm not sure if Hidden Power is going to take care of them in one hit. And they have Thunderbolt, which can do 4 times damage to me. Doing a rigorous mental analysis of this, I do think that I'd be able to beat her. After all, I'm probably going to one-shot the Steelix with Surf. But just to be extra cautious, I decide to face Price. After all, his badge is going to boost my special attack, making Surf even more powerful than it already is. Seals first, and this is a case where I think it just makes sense to use Surf against it, even though it resists the move. I knock it out in two turns, and next is Dugong. I go for Surf again, it does a third, Dugong strikes back with Headbutt, which doesn't matter because it can't flinch me because I'm faster, and then I knock it out with two more Surfs. I got lucky there because I did get a crit with the final one. Piloswine's next, and this thing is an Ice Ground type, so yeah, I one hit it with Surf. Price, as always, was just terrible. He does provide Mantine with a useful TM though, because Icy Wind could be effective. But for now, I'm going to hold off on teaching it, after all, I have to defeat Jasmine next. I give her the secret potion, it heals Amphi, and now I'm ready to take her on. She leads with Magnemite. Now, I really need Hidden Power Ground to get the one hit. And it does. Okay, that's good. I take out the next Magnemite with the same amount of ease, and then I move on to the Steelix. Okay, Surf should get the one hit, right? It does, and with that, Mantine's earned its last stat boost. Today, we're just gonna skip a large portion of the Rocket plotline. Like, Mantine doesn't have any resets here, and yet can just, like, surf through everything. I'll show the battle against the rival in the underground, but, uh, this battle is never that hard. By this point in the playthrough, Mantine has learned Wing Attack, and while this move did get a big upgrade from Generation 1, I'm not sure it's gonna be particularly useful today, just because of how low my attack stat is. After all, I have 102 special attack and 66 attack. It might have even been better just to teach Icy Wind and use that against the Meganium here, but either way, I take the victory. I finish off the Rocket plotline, here Mantine learns Return, and then I journey through Ice Path. Okay, so Mantine really hasn't been running into any challenges up until this point, so let's just go into Claire's gym and smash everyone. Oh, the uh, first Rotini survives my Surf. I guess it resists it, like maybe Return would have done more damage. It paralyzes me as a result, and then the second Rotini starts using Dragon Rage, which is doing so much damage to me. The third one outspeeds, hits with Dragon Rage, and knocks Mantine out. Okay, so I have to admit something here. I did not save before this random trainer. I did not expect him to be a challenge. But yeah, I'm going to black out now. I'm going to let all my other Pokemon faint. I am allowed to do this if I want with Pokemon. I just make sure that I don't win the battle with any of my HM mules. After I black out, I do increment the reset counter because I consider this a fail for Mantine. But it's really more of a player error in this case because I should have taught Icy Wind. I teach it in the place of Hidden Power Ground, and with the Never Melt Ice, I'm now ready to smash my way through all these dragons. After defeating all of them, Mantine's only level 44, so I want to take it up to level 45 so it's above the next damage rounding threshold. I head south of Blackthorn City to do this training, and now I'm ready to face Claire. She leads with Dragonair, and I'm really hoping that my special attack boost, the Never Melt Ice, and the Ice type boost from Price's badge is going to allow me to one shot the Dragonair. I hit it, and it survives! No! So now it gets to use Thunder Wave, which paralyzes Mantine, and this is terrible, because while I can take out the first Dragonair, the second one and the third one are going to be quite scary. The second one most so, because it knows Thunderbolt. And when it hits me for the first time, I was actually surprised with how little damage it does, and then I like clued into the fact that Mantine has a beastly special defense stat. Yeah, I probably should have fought Jasmine earlier on. Still, its special defense stat isn't enough for me to survive the Dragonair, and Mantine goes down. So I head south of Blackthorn City to continue my training. The next damage rounding threshold is level 48, so I think it makes sense to shoot for that threshold. And believe me, I would like to level up to 50 to get two damage rounding thresholds to really make these Dragonairs a secure one hit, but that's going to take way too long, because with the slow growth rate and the awful level curve in Johto, it takes me so long to get Mantine up to level 48. From the time Claire defeated me to the time I'm fighting her again, it took a total of six real-time minutes for just three levels. Okay, please let this be enough. I go for Icy Wind, and it one-hits the first Dragonair. Okay, that's good. 
But was that just a favorable damage roll? I go for Icy Wind again, and it one-shots the second Dragonair. Okay, I think this is consistent now. Icy Wind takes out the third Dragonair, and I move on to Kingdra for the first time. I think it makes most sense to use Return here. It does about a third, Kingdra fails a Smokescreen, I hit with Return again, it hits with Smokescreen, but that doesn't prevent my last return and I take it out. Mantine clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 12 seconds after Claire, but it really did have to sacrifice a lot of time to defeat her. So let's check back in with Skarmory and see how it does after Chuck. Well first of all, I get access to a powerful HM move now in the form of Fly. Because Peck could be useful to knock Pokemon out in one turn, I'm going to keep that move and instead delete Mud Slap. After all, if I can avoid using Fly, I want to because it has 95% accuracy and it also takes two turns, which is just slow. I pick up the Pink Bow, defeat the Red Gyarados, smash my way through the Rocket Plotline, no resets here. I actually don't know if any Pokemon is ever going to reset in the Rocket Plotline from this date forward. I know I have in the past, but that's just because I was really bad in my old videos. And with that out of the way, I'm ready to face Price. Seals first, I go for Fly, and it takes it out in one hit. Okay, that's good. Skarmory levels up to level 35, and then Price sends in Dugong. I go for Fly again, it does half. Dugong hits with Aurora Beam. Luckily, it doesn't lower my attack stat, and I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, time for the Piloswine. I go for Fly, it does over half. Piloswine uses Fury Attack, just perfect play from Price. And then I use Fly again. While I'm in the air, it misses a Blizzard. Like, why doesn't Blizzard hit when the Pokemon's in the air? I think it really should, like snowstorms and stuff. Believe me, I know about them. I live in Canada. They definitely hit things that are in the air. Anyways, my second Fly takes Price's Ace out. And with that, I've earned myself a special attack boost. But not that it's going to matter, because Skarmory doesn't learn any moves that use this stat. And this is when I'll mention the glitch. Unless your special attack, before considering badge boosts, is over 206, you don't get a special defense boost. So yeah, I don't think today, in the entire playthrough, Skarmory is going to get the special defense boost that it deserves. As a result from Price's badge, Mantine really gets an asymmetrical advantage, because it gets a special attack boost, which is its best attacking stat, and its special defense was already outstanding, whereas Skarmory, who has weak special defense, isn't going to get a boost for it throughout the entire playthrough because of this glitch. Now you might say, that's unfair, you should find a patched ROM that just takes this out of the game so that the game is fair. I really like playing these games as they were released. The only thing that I allow myself to manipulate is the starting Pokemon at the beginning of the game. So setting my DVs, choosing my hidden power, all of that happens right at the beginning. And that's the same time that I replace my starter anyways. So to me, it feels like that's in the spirit of the challenge. Okay, so Skarmory has to contend with Jasmine next. And here, I'm obviously going to have to use hidden power ground. But that's not going to do very much damage. So I fly to Goldenrod City, surf south to this little beach area, and defeat the three trainers here. After that, the final one gives me the soft sand, and then I head to the department store where I can pick up some vitamins. By the way, I did this with Mantine as well. For Skarmory, I use protein until I max out its attack stat, and then I also use a calcium. Now, it's time to face Jasmine. Obviously, Hidden Power one-shots both of the Magnemites. I get the opportunity to learn Price's favorite fury attack, but I say no. After all, I'm a little bit wiser than Price. As I started to fight Steelix and saw how much damage Hidden Power was doing, I realized I didn't really have to be worried for this fight. After all, Skarmory's high attack stat means it can one-hit the Magnemites with consistency, and its high defense stat means that Steelix can basically do no damage to me. It doesn't even bring Skarmory down to orange health before I- uh, oh yeah, Jasmine has a hyper potion, so of course she heals. However, Iron Tail's terribly inconsistent, so I still managed to take the Steelix out anyways. It did take Skarmory to orange health, but I don't think that's much of a victory for you, Jasmine. And now Skarmory gets its final badge boost, and this one is to its defense. And this is just great because this is a percentage boost, meaning that Skarmory has 144 defense. Like, look at all of its other stats. It has 63 special attack. This thing is not going to lose to any physical attacks from now on. So I'm going to skip the rocket plotline again. It's just boring. As I defeat the rival in the underground, I want to mention a weird asymmetry here that I haven't noticed until this point. Like, I can't believe I didn't pick up on this throughout my entire life. I've played these games so many times. On the rival's team with Mantine, he has Meganium. And I know that he has Feraligator here because I faced that a lot as a kid. But when he chose the Fire Starter, he only has Quilava in this fight. Like, what? Why isn't it a Typhlosion? I guess in this case, it isn't a high enough level to evolve, but why wouldn't they just like artificially make it evolve? After all, Lance has a bunch of weird Dragonites that are at low levels. This one feels like a very strange choice to me. 
So I take an easy victory, and now it's time to face Claire. I go into the fight at level 45, and I'm really hoping that Fly is going to give me enough damage to one-shot the Dragonairs. Also, please don't miss. It doesn't against the first one, and unfortunately Dragonair survives. As a result, it paralyzes Skarmory, and uh, it looks like I am destined for the same fate that Mantine had. I get hit by a huge Thunderbolt from the second Dragonair, and while the third one doesn't finish me off with Ice Beam, the Kingdra does with Surf. Okay, so Skarmory is not going to gain a big lead here, because it has to do all the same training that Mantine did, taking it up to level 48. But will this give me the one hits against the Dragonairs? It does on the first one, it does on the second one, and it does on the third one. Okay, so I've got this. I use Fly on Kingdra, it does more than half. Surf hits me for a little bit, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Skarmory clocks in on the Claire split with a time of 1 hour, 8 minutes, and 41 seconds. So now, Mantine is only 2 minutes and 31 seconds behind Skarmory. While the gap did widen throughout the mid-game, it's starting to get closer, okay? I'm really hopeful that we might have a very close match on our hands. I collect a bunch of items throughout Johto, mostly rare candies, and then the next major battle that I have to face is the rival in Victory Road. Uh, for Mantine, I use Surf the entire way. I one-hit everything until the Meganium comes out. I went for Wing Attack here. Like, it looks like it's doing a lot more damage, but like, I think probably Icy Wind would be better. Either way, I take the victory in two easy hits, and now Mantine's ready for the league. Against this same rival, we can see that Skarmory's also learned Steel Wing. It's useful against the Sneasel, but like, that's probably the only time I'm going to use this move. It's really bad. Steel-type moves are not good offensively until like Generation 6 when they introduce the Fairy-type. Finally, the rivals evolved to Starter into Typhlosion, but I have Hidden Power Ground, so I knock it out, move on to the Golbat, and you can see throughout this entire fight that Skarmory is starting to lose time just because it can't one-hit everything. But still, it manages to take the victory, and now both of the Pokémon are prepared for the League. Let's start with Mantine against Will. Surf one-shots the first Zatu, Surf almost one-hits the Jinx, it strikes back with Psychic doing about a sixth, and then I knock it out. That's my great special defense for you. Slowbro's next, looks like things are going to be pretty slow against it. I take it out over four turns, I probably should have just kept using Surf even after it used Amnesia. That seems to be the theme with Mantine, just use Surf, if you're using a different move, you're probably doing something wrong. Either way, Will's team is very easy, and I'm moving on to Koga. Wing Attack 2 hits the Ariados. Next, he sends in Fortress. I accidentally used a wing attack here, like whoops. Surf is definitely better, it takes it out in one hit after that. Mox next, I take it out with two Surfs. Then Crobat comes out, it loves to use double team, so I miss a little bit here. Koga heals it with a full restore, but eventually I hit with enough Surfs and it goes down. Last is Venomoth, and this thing is a dual electric type, so it could do eight times damage to me, but luckily I knock it out. Okay, time for Bruno. Now in generation two, the Hitmons got big boosts to their special defense stats, like they're all quite specially defensive. So in this case, I think that it does make sense to use wing attack with Mantine. Unfortunately, my physical attack just isn't high enough and I'm not one hitting any of them. Well, I one hit the Onyx cause yeah, it's bad against Surf. Bruno sends in Machamp and this thing does no rock slide, which does a lot of damage to Mantine. I survive and I get a second wing attack in knocking it out. All right, Bruno's using Hitmonlee last because it knows no moves that are good against Mantine. And in this case, it's his Pokemon that's the most frail, so Wing Attack does get the one hit. Good. So we've made it to Karen, and she's quite often the trainer that slows Pokemon down. She has awful status conditions that can mess up even the mightiest of Pokemon. Today I decided to go with the Paralyzed Cure Berry because I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to one-hit the Vileplume. As a result, I get hit by a Sand Attack and a Confuse Ray before I knock the Umbreon out. While Surf doesn't one-hit the Gengar, it does use Curse, which knocks itself out. Surf one-hits the Murkrow. I use my Paralyzed Cure Berry to heal Paralysis against the Vileplume. And then Houndoom comes out. Now, here's the really unfortunate thing. I go for Surf against it, which would get the one hit, but I miss because of Sand Attack, get hit by Curse Damage, and Houndoom finishes Mantine with Crunch. So if you're one of the viewers that watches in the background, just like look over at the screen now while I fight this Gengar. I hit myself in Confusion, its Lick paralyzes, I hit myself in Confusion again, it uses Curse. Ugh. I hit myself in Confusion again and then take Curse Damage. Like... Yeah. Then it uses Lick again, which paralyzes me for a second time because my berry healed the first one. Like, I cannot believe how bad this fight was. <laughs> As a result, I do end up going down to the Vile Plume's Petal Dance and Curse Damage. So that's two resets on Karen for Mantine. Luckily, in the next fight, the Gengar just goes for Spite, which, uh, 
really doesn't spite me in this case. As a result, they sweep through the rest of her team, and Mantine's moving on to the champion with a time of 1 hour, 24 minutes, and 59 seconds. So let's see how Skarmory does with the Elite Four. Will's first, and you can see that Skarmory is quite different from Mantine in this case. While I'm not one-hitting the Zatu, or like the Slowbro, it takes a while to knock the Slowbro out, this thing loves to set up. On the other hand, I am able to one-hit Pokemon like the Executor, as well as the Jinx, just because of my high physical attack. Against Koga, Skarmory could be much better. After all, Koga is a Bug-type leader, but he uses Baton Pass with the Ariados before Fly takes it out. He sends in Fortress and then uses Protect so that Fly does nothing. This is a really big brain play. Well done, Koga. As a result, he's going to use Protect every time I use Fly, so I have to use Hidden Power to knock it out. This is kind of annoying, because then when the Fortress gets to low health, it's like, ha ha ha, this is my time, and it uses Explosion, which deals decent damage to Skarmory, considering I'm a Steel-type. Fly is a bit scary against the Crobat, so I use Return to knock it out, and then all that's left is Venomoth. And this thing is a Fire-type, so I have to be very careful, but I knock it out in one hit. Okay, time for Bruno. Unfortunately, the Hitmontop knows Detect, so I can't use Fly against it, but I can use Fly against the Hitmonchan for a one hit, against the Machamp for another one hit. That thing rarely goes down in one turn, it's really nice when I get it. I use Hidden Power Ground against the Onyx and take it out over two turns, and finally, I accidentally use Hidden Power against the Hitmonlee, like, ugh. It hits High Jump Kick, but it doesn't do very much, and I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, so will Karen delay Skarmory like she delayed Mantine? In this case, I use the Bitterberry, and that's because I can use Fly to dodge Umbreon's first attack. On the second turn, it likes to use Confuse Ray, Bitterberry heals this, and then I use Fly again, dodging the second Sand Attack. And finally, when I'm on the ground, it goes for another Sand Attack, but misses, and, uh, oh great, okay, so my Fly misses, I get pulled out of the air, I hit myself, it hits Faint Attack, and then finally I knock it out. Ah, Karen is so annoying. But then next, she sends in Houndoom. I use Hidden Power Ground, which is my most powerful move against it. It survives, and then uses Flamethrower, which does so much to Skarmory. Karen responds by using a Max Potion healing Houndoom, but it isn't enough to save it from being knocked out. Gengar is next, I outspeed, but Hidden Power Ground doesn't quite knock it out, so it gets to put a curse on me. And because of that, I can't use Fly against the Murkrow, after all, I'll just faint when I'm in the air. I try for Return to get the one hit, but Murkrow survives with a sliver, and Skarmory goes down. Are you kidding? Like, ah, that was so close. If I was level 53, I would have one hit. I make it back to the Houndoom in the next fight, and here I'll just mention something, which is it uses Roar, which pulls out one of my HM mules, and then I have to switch back into Skarmory. And a lot of you suggested, why not just deposit your HM mules before the league? And I really don't like doing this because it really skews the real-time completion, because then when I finish the league, I have to walk to Cherry Grove City to pick up all my HM mules. The time depositing them and withdrawing them from the PC also wastes time, and I just don't think this is a good idea. Plus, when the enemy uses Roar, they get an advantage because they get to hit my Pokemon for free when I switch it back in. And in this case, that advantage is quite good for Karen because she knocks me out with Flamethrower. And then, in the next fight, Houndoom critical hits with Flamethrower, and yeah, it polishes Skarmory off with ease. Okay, so here's what I have to do to win this fight. I have to use the Soft Sand to boost the power of Hidden Power Ground, so that I can knock the Houndoom out in a single hit. Oh, uh, wait, with the Soft Sand, it doesn't take it out in a single hit? Are you kidding me? Also, the Houndoom burns me? Ah. Okay, I really don't like doing this in Generation 2, but I am going to use a rare candy now, so that Skarmory levels up to 53, which is over the next damage rounding threshold. After all, this, in combination with the Soft Sand, should be enough for me to knock the Houndoom out. Well, uh, that is, unless I don't take massive damage against the Umbreon because of its trolley tactics, and uh, part of this damage is getting my accuracy lowered, so I miss Hidden Power on the Houndoom and it finishes me with Flamethrower. However, when that doesn't happen and I use Hidden Power against the Houndoom, now I take it out in one hit. I also take the Gengar out in one hit, so I bypass the Curse, and then I can one-hit the Murkrow with Fly. So this fight got way easier, just one level higher. I take the Vileplume out, and with that, Skarmory is ready for the champion. Let's compare these times, because after Karen, they are getting quite close. Skarmory is now only a minute and 25 seconds faster than Mantine. But how fast will each of them get through the champion? Let's find out. Let's start with Mantine because it's definitely the underdog here. Lance sends in Gyarados first, and I think that Return is probably the best choice. It does about a third, Gyarados hits with Hyper Beam, doing a third to me, and then I get two more turns to knock it out. Okay, 
That's good. Dragonite's next. I have the Nevermelt Ice to boost Icy Wind's damage, and it takes it out in one hit. Alright, that's good. I go for it again against the next Dragonite, but it must have been a favorable roll because this one doesn't go down. But it just misses Thunder Wave. That's because in Generation 2, the AI has a permanent debuff that means all of its status moves have a 25% chance of failing. Okay, so I've made it to the Aerodactyl. It outspeeds and does a lot of damage with Rock Slide, but my next Surf takes it out. Alright, I made it to the final Dragonite, but I'm not sure I can take it down. I go for Icy Wind, and it just barely doesn't take it out. But then Dragonite misses Hyper Beam, and as a result, I get two Icy Winds in a row, knocking it out. All that's left is Lance's Charizard, but Mantine is faster, he uses Surf, and takes it down. So my cute Manta Ray defeats the League and clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 26 minutes, and 13 seconds. Can Skarmory beat that time? Well, it's certainly poised to. Return does more than half to Gyarados, it sets up Rain Dance, and I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, that was easier. It's time for Dragonite. My most powerful move here is Fly, and I'm pretty sure Dragonite's gonna survive, and that's why I've brought the Paralyzed Cure Berry into this fight. Dragonite does live, but it lives with more than half. Mmm, I was expecting to do more than that. My berry cures Paralysis, and then I use Fly again, but Dragonite doesn't go down. At least it misses Thunder Wave. Okay, so the second Dragonite is definitely gonna paralyze me. That's basically guaranteed. I start using Return, and Lance's Dragonite uses Blizzard, doing a lot of damage to Skarmory, taking it to Orange before Charizard comes out. I use Fly, but I don't move first and Charizard knocks Skarmory out with Flamethrower. Okay, so the whole reason I didn't move first there is because Paralysis. I tried coming into the fight with Detect instead. I was like, maybe this move will be helpful, like I can stop the Dragonite from using Thunder Wave or something like that. But this time I just faint to the second Dragonite after it uses Blizzard a lot. Okay, so one of my favorite moves in the game is Rest. Skarmory is very defensive, so if I use Rest, perhaps I can stall some of Lance's Pokemon out. If you're paying really close attention to the timer now, you will have noticed that Skarmory is officially behind Mantine for the first time in this entire video. On Lance's second Dragonite, I decide to stall it out with Blizzard. After all, when I use Rest, I can heal Paralysis and then retain my speed for the rest of the fight. Because Blizzard only has 5 PP, I can stall it out long enough so that Lance stops using this powerful move, and then I can take the Dragonite down. Next, Lance sends in Charizard, but this time I'm faster. But Return doesn't knock it out in a single hit. Ah, uh, so I guess that's it. Wait, okay, Skarmory survives a flamethrower, and I do get to knock it out. Next is Dragonite. I decided to go for rest here because I know I'm not going to knock it out in one hit. It goes for Outrage doing a bit, because this is a special move in Generation 2. I figured because it's using this move so much, it's eventually going to hit itself in confusion a couple times, and I'll be able to proceed to the Aerodactyl with full health. But uh, then the Dragonite surprises me, because I totally forgot it has Fire Blast. And it also burns Skarmory. So at this point, it's just given up on using Outrage, and it knocks Skarmory out. I tried again. This time I figured out that Lance's Dragonite is using Outrage when Skarmory is at low health, because it sees that Outrage could get the KO, but then I use Rest and it's locked into the move. Unfortunately, it's hard to time this, because I don't know when the Dragonite is going to hit itself in confusion from Outrage, and I don't know how long I'm going to be asleep, that sort of thing. So once again, the Dragonite polishes me off with Fire Blast. So Mantine is fighting Erika in Kanto, and uh, believe me, this fight's very easy for it. I even get put to sleep, but that doesn't matter. I sweep through our team and take the victory. Okay, back to Skarmory. Let's see what it can do. Well, uh, apparently not very much, because this time I'm paralyzed going into the second Dragonite and just knocks me out with two blizzards after I can't move. Ah, just great. And here's another thing that makes this fight really awful. Even when Skarmory arrives at the final Dragonite with full health, it's randomizing between Outrage and Fire Blast. And that means that there's a 50% chance that it just starts using Fire Blast and knocks me out, which is exactly what happens in this fight. Okay, so where's Mantine right now? Mantine is fighting Sabrina, and it makes quick work of all of her psychic types. At this point, Skarmory's at 13 resets, well into the double digits. I'm uh, now starting to really worry. I figured maybe I can use Detect to PP stall the Dragonite out. After all, Fire Blast only has 5 PP. I can even use it to get through the second Dragonite with Blizzard a little bit faster. But Charizard can also critical hit with Flamethrower and knock me out before I get to the final Dragonite. I genuinely have to say that this fight might be the most frustrating fight I've had in Johto in recent memories. Normally Pokemon reset one to three times against tough trainers in Johto, and then they're able to figure out a strategy that allows them to get through. In Kanto it's much different, like if you can't beat a leader at a certain level, you just can't, there is no strategy that will get you through. 
For those reasons, it always feels like playing solo challenges in the Generation 1 games are more challenging than in this game. But today it feels like the challenge from Kanto has been imported into Johto for Skarmory at Lance. Actually, after this fight, which is going to be my 17th reset, by the way, I just decided, like, I can't deal with this anymore. I have to step away from the computer and I'll come back later. So I went and got pizza with my fiance. It was absolutely outstanding. So of course over dinner I talked way too much about Pokemon stuff and I talked about what movesets would be good against Lance with Skarmory. And I eventually figured out that maybe I have to use the most Generation 2 moveset of all, which features Detect, Sleep Talk, and Rest. Now, I would really like Skarmory to be using Return instead of Fly, but in this case I have to use Fly because if I want the other three moves, I can't actually delete Fly while I'm in front of Lance. I could of course black out at this point, and maybe that's the right choice, but if I do that, I'm definitely giving the win to Mantine, and I want to get through this as fast as possible. After all, Red is known for walling Pokemon at the end of the game, so even if Skarmory loses a lot of time here, it still could catch up. In this case though, I don't get lucky with the Sleep Talk strategy, and once again I faint the Charizard. At this point, Mantine is stomping through Misty, through Surge, through Brock, through Blaine, and finally through the worst gym leader in all of Kanto, Janine. Uh, guess what Skarmory's doing? Yeah, it's still losing to Lance. At this point, with a little bit more experience, I've finally determined that Detect is pretty much just useless. It's better to have Return, Fly, and then Sleep Talk and Rest. This way, when Sleep Talk rolls for a move to use, it's either going to choose Return or Fly and deal damage, or it's going to choose Rest and heal me again. Yes, in Generation 2, this is how it works. But still, with this overpowered strategy, the resets still stack up for Skarmory. Like, this is so bad. By the 27th reset, just check the time. It's uh, an hour and 45 minutes now for Skarmory. And if we jump over to Mantine when it's facing blue, it's only an hour and 42 minutes. So it's actually three minutes ahead of where Skarmory is at Lance. Now that being said, blue does cause a reset here. So maybe Mantine is gonna get walled. The issue is, is that while Surf is powerful, once I get to the Gyarados, there isn't really a good option. Like in this case, I have to knock it out with Return and look at how much it's doing. It's doing very little. And then Gyarados strikes back with Hyper Beams and they do so much. Luckily this time, I do take it out and I move on to the Executor. I figure that here healing makes most sense. After all, this thing is either gonna set up with Solar Beam or it's just gonna like try and attack with something else. But when Solar Beam hits, it does a lot of damage. I try to knock it out with wing attack, but I'm not doing enough damage and I go down to leech seed damage. Okay, so it's time to incorporate in another Johto standard. Let's try Curse. After all, the first Pidgeot is not intimidating at all. I can just set up Curse here basically for free. After all, this move boosts my defense stat as it boosts my attack stat. After two turns, I knock the Pidgeot out, move on to the Alakazam, and take it out over two hits. Okay, time for the ride on. I'm also using the leftovers here so that every turn that I'm in battle, I gain back health. Gyarados comes out, it uses Hyper Beam, and it gets a critical hit, which does so much to Mantine. It survives, rests, and then after that I decide I should probably set up fully with Curse. I take my time, knock the Gyarados out, knock the Executor out in a single hit. Obviously Arcanine moves first, but Flamethrower does basically nothing. And then I take it down with two uses of Wing Attack. So Mantine has defeated Blue with a time of 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 6 seconds. But what about Skarmory? Because it might not even get by Lance at that time. So I don't really know how to sugarcoat this, but Skarmory is really bad here at Lance. I'd already started thinking about what I was going to do for my second playthrough, because I need a way to get through this fight that isn't like this. In this case, I roll a lucky sleep talk against Charizard. I survive its flamethrower with one hit point, and then I knock it out with return. Then, because I have so low health, Dragonite is going to choose Outrage, I can heal with Rest and take very little damage. I do have Sleep Talk, so I'm out of PP for it, but in a strange turn of events, Dragonite chooses Outrage, and then I knock it out with Return. Okay, so like, that's fine, I guess Skarmory wins. I knock the Aerodactyl out, and Skarmory defeats Lance with a time of 1 hour 46 minutes and 59 seconds. So uh, yeah, that is a small morale boost because I wasn't slower than Mantine's blue time, but still the Aquatic Ray is now facing red. First is Pikachu. I go for Surf because electric types don't resist water type moves and Pikachu goes down in a single hit. Next is Espeon. I go for Surf again, it does half, I take a bit of damage from Psychic, and then I move on to the Snorlax. Now this thing is terrifying, it is definitely the strongest NPC Pokemon in the entire game. Also it hits really hard with physical moves in the form of Body Slam, so I need to set up. 
I go for Curse, and this pretty much ensures that I'm going to be able to knock it out. It can't do much damage to me, I'm healing with leftovers, and then my wing attack is doing so much that I take it down. Next is Blastoise, wing attack takes it out in two hits, but I did suffer a lot of damage during that. Venusaur is next, this is why I retained wing attack, because as it charges up for a solar beam, I knock it out in one hit with super effective damage. Last is Charizard, Mantine's typing and special defense means it shrugs off flamethrower, but unfortunately Charizard burns me, so that means my wing attack doesn't do as much as I was hoping. But I can take things slow here, I heal with rest, and then I knock Charizard out with Surf. Mantine finishes the game with a time of 1 hour, 50 minutes, and 39 seconds. So things are very bad for Skarmory. Like, very bad. I swear I try to play every Pokemon as well as is possible. It was very obvious that blacking out in the league, training to a higher level, and then coming back to face Lance definitely would have made Skarmory clock in with a time slower than Mantine. It might have got a better time than it will get in this playthrough, but I can't go back, I can't change that now, I'll just have to optimize it in the second playthrough. I sweep through the Kanto gyms with these, oh uh, and then I run out of PP essentially on Brock, like I can't knock his Pokemon out, so I have to use all of Rest and Sleep Talk's PP to finally knock his rocks out with Struggle. I wasn't sure this was even going to work out because Struggle does deal recoil damage, but Skarmory pulls it off. <laughs> I'm feeling real bad about this Pokemon right now. I expected great things from it, and it is letting me down. We've crossed the two-hour mark at this point. And next is Blaine, who potentially could be a problem, but luckily his Pokemon are weak enough and Skarmory just sweeps through them. I take out Janine, and now Skarmory has to face Blue. He leads with Pidgeot. I go for Return, it does half. It switches me out with Whirlwind. That's annoying. I switch back in, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Oh, Bellsport has a chance to learn Rap. Just, just great. <laughs> Arcanine's next. I go for return. It does like, oh gosh, it does like one quarter. Arcanine hits a huge flamethrower. Of course it burns Skarmory and then he knocks me out. I have to run a few errands and when I get back to blue, now I have curse. I wanted to set it up here on the Pidgeot, but what I said earlier is not true. Pidgeot does not provide a free opportunity for this because it has Whirlwind. So as I get set up, it's just like, nope, I'm just going to switch you out so you don't have any of that set up anymore. I actually decided to reset here because I just didn't want to play against it. I was like, I don't want it to switch me out again and have that happen all over. So I went to the PC and here I deposited my HM mules because it is strategically relevant. Now I can't use Whirlwind on me so I can set up Curse with Impunity. After that, Fly 1 hits the Pidgeot, the Arcanine, and the Alakazam. The Gyarados does survive, he gets really annoying with full restores here, but I take it out with my second fly. Executor falls to one hit, and then because Rhydon resists flying moves, I have to take two turns to knock it out. With that, Skarmory has finally, at long last, reached the end of the game. How is it going to do against Red? Pikachu's first, and uh, yeah, I only have fly here. I know, I can't unlearn this move unless I go to the move deleter. And I really should do that, because Pikachu does so much damage with Thunder. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna win. Also, Thunder hits me when I'm in the air, so bad plan. I think I can tell watching this footage back that I was a little bit thrown off at this point. I was frustrated. Also, I was playing this in a weekend where I did six playthroughs total. And uh, yeah, I was exhausted. This was the last one that I did. And so here I'm trying to beat Red with Fly and like it just is not working. Finally, I figure it out. I head back to the move deleter, delete Fly, get another TM for return. By the way, these respawn every Sunday. And then with a bit of additional training under Skarmory's belt, I'm ready to face Red again. Hopefully return can one hit the Pikachu. And it does. All right, that's good. Obviously, Red's going to select the Pokemon next that he thinks has the best chance against Skarmory, so he sends out Charizard because it has a super effective move in the form of Flamethrower. Please return, get the job done. But it doesn't even do half, and I am level 73. Charizard hits with Flamethrower, gets a critical hit, I should say, and it knocks Skarmory out in one hit. Okay, so I was trying that fight with the uh, Leftovers, but maybe the Pink Bow will give me a two hit on the Charizard. But uh, no, it won't, and Skarmory survives with 24 hit points. This is not looking good once again. So there's no way that I can do it at level 73. I am going to have to level up more so that I can two hit the Charizard. That's the only way. So let's try the next damage rounding threshold, which is level 75. With the leftovers, return is not two hitting the Charizard. I tried to do some shenanigans against it and use rest and sleep talk together, but that doesn't work out. So I level up Skarmory more and at level 78, I am finally able to two hit the Charizard. I take the Espeon down in two hits, just barely surviving a Psychic. By the way, that's actually why I'm not using the pink bow. I need the leftovers to ensure that I survive the Psychic. Because if I can do that, I can get to the Snorlax, and this thing has no chance against Skarmory. I set up Curse fully, and from there I should have the guaranteed sweep. 
I knock Snorlax out with a single return, I knock Venusaur out with a single return, and all that Red has left is Blastoise. I knock it out, and Skarmory clocks him with a time of 2 hours, 43 minutes, and 48 seconds, with 40 resets at level 78. This took 8 hours and 36 minutes of game time. So let's compare all the results that we have up until this point. I think it's very interesting because Skarmory was so clearly dominant until it reached Lance. And then after that, it just got slammed. Mantine maintained roughly a 20 to 23 minute advantage over it until the end of the blue fight. But then, Red set Skarmory back double this time. So Mantine beat the game 53 minutes and 9 seconds faster. If we examine my Gen 2 leaderboard as it stands today, note the uh, column that is the attempt number, so we can see that these results are most comparable to Octillery and Piloswine's results. With its first playthrough alone, Mantine is just slower than Houndoom. So I think Mantine has a very good chance of getting into the A tier with some refinement. However, Skarmory currently has the worst time that I've got in Pokemon Crystal since I revised my rule set at the beginning of 2022. Still, I think that it does have potential to be the most improved Pokemon in today's video. After all, once I figure out Lance and Red, I'm sure it's going to be smooth sailing. However, will it be able to convert its lead that it gets in the early game into a lead overall? Well, let's find out. First of all, let's examine the optimizations that I made for Mantine's playthrough. So let's identify all of the threats that Mantine faced in its playthrough. First was Rival 3 in the Burned Tower. That was pretty scary. There's some damage ranges there that I need to figure out. Then it was Chuck. After all, I didn't get great damage ranges against the Polyrath, and Dynamic Punch was really annoying. The status conditions are just awful. Next was Claire. I didn't get good damage ranges on the Dragonairs, and I had to waste time training. After that, I reset against Karen because she was awful as usual. And then finally, I reset against Blue. Now there's one fix that I can make to Mantine's play that will solve many of these problems all at once. As I went through the playthrough, I realized just how bad its attack stat is, and I really only wanted to be using special moves the entire time. Also, its high special defense stat meant that the 4 times electric type damage that it takes was not actually that scary. As a result, I think I can give up Hidden Power Ground in favor of Hidden Power Ice. After all, this does special type damage, so it'll utilize Mantine's better offensive stat. With this move, I'm able to consistently solve the rival in Burn Tower. I can one-hit the Haunter with Surf, one-hit the Magnemite with Surf because it doesn't resist this move, one-hit the Zubat with Surf because it's weak, and then I can use Hidden Power Ice on the Bayleaf for super effective damage. Now, I'm really proud of how I solved Chuck. So what I do is when I go out to sea to surf, I'm going to fight all of the trainers here. After all, Mantine needs to train because it's a slow growth rate Pokemon. If I take a pattern through the Whirl Islands that is roughly a 5, like it's the shape of the character 5, then I get to the island and I'm going to avoid the Poke Center and immediately pick up the Secret Potion. Then I can use Abra to teleport back to Olivine City, and here I can give Jasmine the Secret Potion and then face her right away. After all, using Surf to defeat her gives Mantine a consistent victory, and it also gives me the defense badge boost before I face Chuck, not to mention all the levels that I gained before I fight him. As a result, Mantine's level 38, and it has no problem in this fight, even when it gets hit and confused by a dynamic punch. Next, I take on Price. He's a really easy, as is always the case. After defeating all the rockets, I pick up some vitamins, and then I fight all the trainers between Mahogany Town and Blackthorn City. This means that by the time I reach Claire, Mantine is level 48. With the Never Melt Ice and Hidden Power Ice, I want to hit all the Dragonairs, and then Kingdra's no problem after that. So I was able to solve all the problems in the Johto portion of the game, now what about the League? Well, Karen's the one that I really have to have a solution for. My route makes Mantine level 54 before this fight, so I use one rare candy to take it up to level 55 over a damage round threshold. Now this is incredibly important because this gives me a guaranteed two hit on the Umbreon. After that, Surf has a guaranteed one hit on the Gengar, preventing Curse, and Hidden Power Ice guarantees a one hit on the Murkrow. Obviously, Surf takes out the Houndoom, and last is Vileplume, but no matter what it can do to me, I'm gonna win. I don't roll the damage for the KO, get paralyzed this time, but I take it out on the second turn. So Mantine has reached Lance with zero resets, and it's also 6 minutes and 30 seconds faster than it was in the previous run. And it should go without saying that uh, the Dragon Master is much easier this time. Hidden Power 1 hits all the Dragonites. Surf one hits the Aerodactyl, and uh, also one hits the Charizard, so that's it. Now I mentioned how I liked the curse strategy against Blue, but there's actually a better option. I can just take the leftovers and use all my rare candies, taking Mantine all the way up to level 70. By doing this, Surf is so powerful that I can basically just spam it against his entire team. It has a guaranteed one hit on the Alakazam, by the way. 
obviously Rhydon's no match, and then I brute force the Gyarados down. Like, this is a bit annoying, but I do manage to take it out. After that, I one-hit the Arcanine, and for a brief moment of reprieve, I use Wing Attack on the Executor, get a lucky critical hit, and knock it out in one turn. At this point, Mantine is almost leveled up, and I have two rare candies, so I fight a few wild encounters in Mount Silver, and then I use the rare candies to take it up to level 73 over the next damage rounding threshold. Okay, now it's time to face Red. Can Mantine do this without any resets? If it does, it will be in the esteemed company of Ho-Oh and Lugia, as one of three Pokémon that have defeated Pokémon Crystal in this way. Against Pikachu, I knock it out with one turn of Surf. Then against Espeon, I take it down with two Surfs, but unfortunately it set up Reflect, which is annoying for the Snorlax. However, that's why I have Curse. I can set this up, improving my defense, and then I can use Rest to heal Paralysis and give Mantine all of its health back. When I wake up, I use Wing Attack, and over three turns, this knocks the Snorlax out. Blastoise is next. Wing Attack takes it down in two hits. I do take some damage from Blizzard, but that's okay. After all, Venusaur is just going to try and set up Sunny Day. I knock it out with Wing Attack, and now I am going to have to survive a Sun-boosted Flamethrower. But uh, remember Mantine's special attack? It's really good. So this is no problem, and I knock the Lizard out over two turns. Mantine did it. No resets. It clocks in with a time of 1 hour 41 minutes and 31 seconds. This is 9 minutes and 8 seconds faster than its previous result. It finished the game at level 73, and its game time was 6 hours and 37 minutes. Honestly, really good results, and unfortunately, it just doesn't quite sneak into the A tier, so Mantine takes the first spot in the B tier. Honestly, if this thing was a medium fast or medium slow growth rate Pokemon, it 100% would have earned a spot in the A tier. So was I able to get Skarmory's time low enough to be competitive with Mantine? And do I have a convincing solution for trainers like Lance? and red. After all, they were absolutely brutal. Here's the thing, I really mulled this over and I thought about using Hidden Power Ground. Now, the problem with that is that while it does solve some fire types, it doesn't solve the ones that really matter. Specifically, Lance's Charizard and his Dragonite, and Red's Charizard. I need a way to solve them. So what physical type does good damage to all three of these Pokemon? Well, the answer is obviously Hidden Power Rock. I think this is really awesome because this is the first time I've actually used Hidden Power Rock. Typically, Pokemon that want a physical attack use Hidden Power Ground, and Pokemon that want a special attack use Hidden Power Ice. So it's going to be really refreshing to try this out today. You might be worried also about Skarmory's electric weakness, but really the only scary electric Pokemon that you fight other than the Magnemites throughout the playthrough is the Kimono Girl who has Jolteon. Unfortunately, before I get there in Azalea Town, the rival's Quilava burns Skarmory, and that leads to my first reset, so it's not getting a reset-free playthrough like Mantine today. I think we can declare the winner in terms of consistency of playthrough. It's definitely Mantine. If you just like want to go through a playthrough and never lose, use that thing. I defeat the rival on my next attempt, and then I move on. And even though the Kimono Girl's Thundershocking Jolteon does paralyze Skarmory, I manage to take it out. After that, I grab Hidden Power, and then I clear out the trainers on Route 38 and 39. This means Skarmory can be level 30 before the rival in Burn Tower. Here, Hidden Power Rock is useful, and it's also more useful than Hidden Power Ground, because the Hard Stone is easier to come by. After all, you can grab it as early as Violet City, and you can also grab it right after you defeat the Pseudo Wudo. Because Hidden Power is Skarmory's best move in this phase of the game, that actually means it's 10% better than it was in the previous playthrough. Of course, better damage ranges mean faster battles, so that is going to speed it up a little bit. I sweep through Morty's team, and this time I'm not going to do the same rooting that I did with Mantine, because I want to head and face Chuck right away. I defeat him without a reset, clear out the hideout, I'm definitely delaying Jasmine, after all I don't have Hidden Power ground this time. I defeat Price easily, and then it's time to face Jasmine. Now while it's annoying to defeat her, after all I'm going to have to use Mud Slap this time, it isn't going to be that bad because Skarmory resists all of her moves. Well, I guess Rock Throat does neutral damage to me, but it's weaker than Iron Tail even when Iron Tail is resisted, so the Steelix just prioritizes that. Also, that move has trash accuracy, so after a couple mud slaps, this is basically a free win. Now, for Claire with Skarmory, I need to be level 50 with the Sharp Beak so that I guarantee Fly gets a one hit on all the Dragonairs. So I've made it to the league with only one reset. Now, in my summary of difficult trainers, I sort of skipped over Karen, so I should mention her. Being level 55 with the Sharp Beak gives Skarmory a guaranteed two hit on the Umbreon, and Hidden Power Rock gets a guaranteed one hit on the Houndoom. 
Because of that, I'm able to sweep her team with ease and move on to Lance. Now, how is this fight gonna go? Well, at level 56, I'm able to take the Gyarados out with two hits from Hidden Power Rock. Now, the Dragonite is gonna take two hits from Hidden Power Rock, but I have Rest just in case it successfully paralyzes me with Thunder Wave. In this case, the second one does, so I have to wait till I take damage, and then I can use Rest to remove Paralysis. Next, Lance sends in Charizard, and obviously I have more than enough speed to move first in one shot with Hidden Power Rock. Okay, I've done this. I will survive the last Dragonite's Fire Blast. In this case, it just goes for Safeguard, and I knock it out. I polish off the Aerodactyl after that, and I've defeated Lance with no resets. Yeah, one reset from the rival earlier on, but no resets at Lance. In Kanto, I pick up the TM for Curse. This is going to be pivotal later in the game. And then I smash my way through the gym leaders. Oh, ah, uh, never mind. Surge hits a Zap Cannon against Skarmory, which paralyzes me. It has a guaranteed paralysis. It's actually not guaranteed in Gen 2, but we'll talk about that another time. Because of this, I can't move and the Magneton knocks me out. In that case, Hidden Power Ground would have been better, but it's really not worth choosing that move because everything else is just terrible if you take it. I defeat Surge on my next attempt, and with that, I make it all the way to blue. Okay, so now it's time to face blue, and for this fight, I also give Skarmory all of my rare candies, and this takes it all the way up to level 72. I set up Curse once against the Pidgeot, and this guarantees a one-hit with Hidden Power. Against the Arcanine as well, I have to survive one Flamethrower, but then I finish it off. Fly one hits Alakazam, Hidden Power Rock one hits Gyarados, Fly one hits Executor, and then things are going to get slow against the Rhydon. I have to take it out with Fly, this is my best move against it. But since I have Rest, I can do it and move on to Red. Alright, for this fight, I'm using the moveset Curse, Hidden Power Rock, Rest, and Return. I can use Return to one-shot the Pikachu and avoid Charm at the beginning of the fight. Next is Charizard, and Hidden Power Rock polishes it off. Espeon follows. I go for Return over two turns, knocking it out, and then Snorlax comes out. Now, there's potential here for me to three-hit it with Return, but I also have Rest and Curse just in case it paralyzes me. This happens, so I'm going to slow things down just a little bit. After fully setting up and healing one more time with Rest, I use Return, knocking Snorlax out in one hit, it knocks Venusaur out in one hit, and it also knocks out the final Blastoise in a single hit. So Skarmory clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 48 minutes, and 8 seconds, with two resets at level 73, and this took 7 hours even of game time. So let's now compare these results. Mantine got through the game 6 minutes and 37 seconds faster. It had two less resets, and they both beat the game at the same level. When considering game time, Mantine was 23 minutes faster, so I think at this point it's undoubtable. Mantine is both more consistent and faster, and today it wins the race. But we still need to rank Skarmory based on its final result. A time faster than 1 hour and 50 minutes means it just barely avoids being at the top of the C tier. It's only 21 seconds faster than Houndoom, but Houndoom finished the game with one additional reset, and by the way they actually tied for game time, they both have exactly 7 hours. So today I'm going to give the edge to Skarmory just barely. I hope you enjoyed the video, like subscribe, bring the Chimeco and comment because I gotta read them all. Also thanks to Vessi, my patrons, and YouTube members for supporting the creation of this video. If you want to see another one just like it, check out this video here where I race the Nidos. I'll see you over there.